God is in his holy temple, and if you didn't know this, then you surely would by the time you've watched Poltergeist 2 The Other Side, the sequel to the terrifying supernatural Spielberg and Hooper original. The sequel where we learn the backstory of the evil force seen in the first movie, where we are given one of the most terrifying villains in horror movie history, in the form of Reverend Henry Kane, the creepy ghost of an old man stalking the Freeling family so he can once again get his hands on little Carol Ann and feed on her life force. Although neither Steven Spielberg or Toby Hooper returned for the sequel and instead were replaced by English director Brian Gibson, best known for directing the British comedy Still Crazy, um, okay, Poltergeist 2 is still a worthy sequel to its powerful predecessor and once again enjoys a feast of special effects frills, a wonderful score by Jerry Goldsmith, along with its powerful messages that family love can conquer sinister forces of evil. Well guys, get ready to bolt the doors, and remember, don't answer any knocks at the doors, especially creepy old men singing about how God is in his holy temple, as we check out 10 things that you may not know about Poltergeist 2, The Other Side. Seriously, God is in his holy temple is the Poltergeist 2 equivalent of They Float. So anyway, let's check out this underrated sequel. Number 10, Deleted Scenes. Over the years, there have been lots of behind the scenes photos circulating around on the interwebs to suggest that Poltergeist 2 was in fact going to be much longer than its one hour and 30 minutes running time and that several scenes were cut from the film. Like this scene where the Freelings are getting harassed at their dining table by a pesky toaster on the loose. And this eerie photo of Reverend Kane looming over an unsuspecting Carol Ann in her bedroom. Apparently several scenes involving the Reverend Kane character had to be cut because the actor who portrayed the part, Julian Beck, had died before filming wrapped up. Heck, in the character's last several scenes, they literally had to use a puppet to hide the fact that the actor was no longer available. Interestingly enough, when I hired the Australian VHS copy of Poltergeist 2 many years ago, the back of the cover said that the Freelings get terrorised by a swarm of angry bees. I don't know if that too was a deleted scene, and the cover designers were getting their information from production notes, or if they got Poltergeist 2 confused with another movie, or if they were talking about the scene where Taylor summons up a heap of butterflies and they just generally can't tell the difference between butterflies and bees. Sadly, there are no bees or Nicolas Cage screaming about bees in Poltergeist 2. Number 9, Giga's Touch. H.R. Giger was a revolutionary visual artist. His works can be both beautiful and the stuff of nightmares, as his work often clashes uncomfortable blends of erotica with terror. When it comes to movies, he will always be remembered for his alien designs, for the movie Alien. But what some fans of the surreal artist may not know is that Giger also lent his talents to Poltergeist 2 and designed some creatures for the spooky sequel, namely the big cane beast seen at the end which to me always kind of looked like the tree monster from the original movie. I don't know if they were supposed to look the same or if it was just coincidental. Giga worked from Zurich, which affected his communication with MGM, who were making the movie in California. And alas, Giga was unhappy with the final product of his work in the movie and put the look of the creatures not looking right down to the lack of communication he had with MGM on the account he stayed in Zurich while working on the movie. But honestly, if you look at some of the designs Giga had in mind for Poltergeist 2, you can see they were pretty darn terrifying. And who knows, it may have been some of his best work ever if the communication was right. Seriously, look at these designs. The potential here is almost tragic. Number 8, Kane's Influence.
So the most appealing aspect of Poltergeist 2 is that the audience finally have a face of the evil behind the ghostly shenanigans of Poltergeist 1. And that was the evil Reverend Kane, the ghost of a crazed religious cult leader who was hell-bent on feeding off the life force of Carol Ann. And the part was played by Julian Beck, who was a painter and poet who had done lots of fear to work. And when he was cast in the role, he had progressive stomach cancer, which literally made him look deathly and terrifying. In fact, when Carol Ann actress Hevro Rook saw him for the first time, she burst into tears. But not only that, his performance is terrifying too. God is in his holy time. Earthly falls, be silent now. The 70s and 80s were the year of the movie Boogeyman, and there were many entries like Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, and Freddy Krueger. But to me, Kane is more terrifying than them, as his terror is more subtle. Heck, he doesn't even have a weapon. And despite the fact he looks sick and weak, he still commands great power. However, it seems that his character had influence on many others who saw Poltergeist 2, as the character featured on the 1987 album cover for Among the Living by metal band Anthrax, and the character was even parodied in Scary Movie 2. Even the way Julian Beck talks is creepy. Like that way he says, That is possible! I get around! I love getting around! Even on a rainy day! Ugh. Number 7. Absent Relatives In the original Poltergeist movie, we learn in the Freeling family there are three kids, Carol Ann, Robbie, and teenage daughter Dana. However, in Poltergeist 2, not only is there no sign of the Dana character, but she isn't even mentioned, almost like she was written out of existence. It's no secret that after the original Poltergeist wrapped up, Dana actress Dominic Dunn was tragically murdered by her jealous ex-boyfriend. So naturally, she couldn't return for the sequel. However, there was going to be a scene where it's explained that Dana is now living in college. But that scene never ended up being filmed. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a big subplot to leave out, guys. You could have done with filling us in on that one. But at least if you wanted to know the fate of Dana Freeling, you could have read the Poltergeist 2 novelization. Oh yeah, there was a novelization. Number 6, Novelization. Yeah, there was a novelization for Poltergeist 2 and it was written by James Kahn, who also wrote the novelization for the original Poltergeist movie along with writing episodes for TV shows such as Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Melrose Place. Now sadly, I haven't read the novelization, but from research I've done, those who have read it love it and say it's actually superior to the movie and features a lot more to the story than the actual movie does, namely the character of Reverend Kane. Apparently the book goes into more detail of his backstory, where it's learned that even when he was alive he had supernatural powers, as he was able to control firestorms and droughts, leading more to the idea that Kane is possessed by a demon, aka the Beast, whereas the movie explains that Kane is the Beast. The novel explains him more to be a pawn used in the Beast's conquest to capture Carol Ann. Although I like the idea of Kane being powered by a super demon, I prefer the idea of him being the source of the evil taking place. Otherwise, if Kane is just a part of the beast's scheme, then it kind of makes Poltergeist 2 redundant. Number 5, The Lost Dimension. When Poltergeist 2 went into production, the movie was originally going to be shot in 3D, utilizing the famous gimmick that had temporarily been brought back in the 80s. Other horror movies made the transaction into the third dimension during the mid 80s too, such as Jaws 3D, Friday the 13th 3D, and Amateurville 3D. However, by the time Poltergeist 2's production was moving along, it had become clear that the 3D gimmick at the time was quickly becoming a passing fad so it was decided to film Poltergeist 2 in traditional 2D. However, the scene in the garage where the Freeling family are trying to flee while being attacked by a heap of power tools was actually filmed in 3D, which you can kind of see in the footage. Why just that particular scene was in 3D is anyone's guess. 
My guess is because it was filmed before they decided to scrap the 3D element from the movie and probably couldn't afford to reshoot the scene. Number 4. Awards When Poltergeist 2 was released, it was met with some critical feedback. Many fans and critics alike felt that it didn't live up to the first movie. Critic Gene Siskel slated the movie for glorifying kids being put in danger and making a thrill out of it. But then again, he hated the first movie too. Heck, even Zelda Rubenstein won a Razzie for her performance as the mystical psychic Tangina. However, there are still fans who defend Poltergeist 2 and claim that it is a good movie and that although the scares and sheer spectacle aren't as good as the first movie, the family characters we grew to love in the first film and their interaction and development is still there. Maybe even more so. In fact, Poltergeist 2 did still have its achievements as it was nominated for Academy Award for Best Special Effects in 1987, along with two Saturn Awards and a Young Artist Award for Hevero Rock's performance. So just remember all that the next time someone tries to tell you that Poltergeist 2 isn't any good. Number 3. Tragedy Strikes The entire Poltergeist franchise is stooped in urban legends surrounding the supposed Poltergeist curse, in which many people connected to the franchise have since died. And Poltergeist 2 doesn't help with keeping the legend at bay, as two of its stars died close to the time of the movie's release. Those actors being Julian Beck, who played Kane, who as mentioned died due to stomach cancer, who actually died while the movie was still in production and Will Sampson, who played Native American medicine man Taylor, also died of liver failure just one year after the movie's release. Supposedly, and I do mean supposedly, there is a popular rumor that Will Sampson performed a ritual on the movie set to cleanse evil spirits that were plaguing the set. I guess what doesn't help with the Poltergeist curse is that Poltergeist 2's director, Brian Gibson, died of bone cancer in 2004. Number 2. Unavailable Characters So Poltergeist 2 introduces two new characters into the Poltergeist saga. One a source of good, the other a source of evil. Those being the Taylor and Kane characters. Both characters enter the lives of the Freeling family. Taylor is there to help and heal, and Kane is there to destroy. And I love how the movie implies that there is actually a centuries old battle going on between Taylor and Kane, a duel that goes beyond our physical realm. However, one character who does return from the original is mystic psychic Tangina. However, it was originally actress Beatrice Strait who was asked to come back once again to play Dr. Lesh, who was in the first movie. It would have made sense for Dr. Lesh to come back than it would Tangina as the Lesh character really bonded and connected with the Freelings in the first film, and even developed a mother-daughter bond with Diana Freeling. And Lesh saw firsthand many of the supernatural happenings of the first film, whereas Tangina just sort of turns up at the end and even gets lots of things wrong. So it would have made more sense and had more emotional merit to see the return of Dr. Lesh. However, Beatrice Strait was ill at the time and couldn't take part in Poltergeist 2. And even Richard Lawson, who played Ryan in the original movie, was asked to return. But he was busy already making another movie. This is nothing against Zelda Rubenstein, who played Tangina, but it just would have made more sense and had more impact had the Dr. Lesh character returned. But, oh well, it is what it is. Number 1. There was going to be a Henry Kane prequel. As we know, Poltergeist eventually got remade into the now largely forgotten 2015 remake. However, during the 90s, there were some ideas floating about doing a prequel to the original Poltergeist series that would have focused on Henry Kane's past, which would have dived into his days as a cult leader, when he sealed himself and his followers underground so they can survive the apocalypse and be stronger in death. The film also would have explored Kane having some kind of supernatural connection to the Carol Ann character. The two ideas floating about were that Carol Ann was the great-great-granddaughter of Kane, or the Freeling family ancestors were part of Kane's cult, but escaped his death plan. But regardless, the Reverend Kane prequel was scrapped before any script took place. 
So if it's a straight up horror movie you seek, then Poltergeist 2 probably isn't the movie for you, as it actually focuses more on the family drama and character development of the Freeman family. If you enjoyed the original and really enjoyed and cared about the characters from that movie, then you will enjoy Poltergeist 2, as the magic between those characters are still there and strong. I see Poltergeist 2 as more being a movie about a family trying to stay together after going through a traumatic experience. A family going through post-traumatic stress disorder, if you will. After all, when we first meet the Freelings in the first movie, they are dripping in wealth. Whereas this time, they start off poor and reduced to selling second-hand vacuum cleaners. So, Poltergeist 2 actually progresses the family's story arc. It's about overcoming trauma and keeping the family together. Hence how the first movie focuses on the mother character, whereas this one focuses on the father. It's about Steve Freeling using his internal strength to keep the family together, so the family can use that strength as a source of inspiration. Well, that's how I see it anyway. Anyway, I'm Minty, and apparently God is in his holy temple. Apparently. See ya!